And joining us now for his final of the five appearances he's had all week here on the agenda, Quam McKenzie, the Medical Director of Diversity and Mental Health for CAMH, Professor of Psychiatry at the University of Toronto. And for the purposes of our discussion today, we remind everybody that you are originally from the UK, parents from the Caribbean, you've lived in the United States for a while, but you're here now by choice. Here being Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And by I, choice. That's bad. By choice. To well, being you know, here some, against my will. No, but I mean, some, some people are born in this city and they don't choose to live, you know, they didn't necessarily have the choice to live here. They're just here because this is where they were born. Their parents are here. But you chose to come here. And uh, I wonder, for starters, what, I guess, possibilities did you see in this city that you may not have seen either in the UK or in Boston where you previously lived? Well, I think there are three levels uh, on which I think about... Uh, uh, the answer to the question the first is professional. So I came to work at uh, the Centre for Addiction and Mental Health in the University of Toronto. And that offers a unique experience to try and uh, improve mental health, not only locally, but nationally and internationally. Then uh, I think for my kids, I have a 17-year-old and a 19-year-old. They were 15 and uh, 17 when we came here. That I just felt that uh, London was uh, mired in the past. It wasn't moving forward quite as quickly as it seems when you see some of the uh, publicity that goes out. Uh, and it was an economy that I didn't think was moving in the direction I, I thought was, was useful. Did your kids notice that too, those I, concerns? I don't think they did at the time, but since they've been here, they really see that there's a lot more opportunity and a lot more openness in Canada. It's, it's possible to get more things done. Let, let me be blunt in a follow-up here. But more possible for two young men of colour in Toronto than, say, in London? My view, yes, because I think that um, Toronto li being linked to the world in the way it is from the diversity, and there's a lot more diversity in Toronto than there is in London, and the fact that it's a young country which is trying to build, uh, offers possibilities that you wouldn't have in a country such as the UK, which is spending a lot of time talking about what it was rather than what it's going to be. Okay, so you and your wife have a decision to make when you come here, and that is where are we going to settle? And you've got your background, she's got her background. Well, what's her background? Um, complex. So mother and mother, her mother is uh, Polish, Jewish, but uh, lived in the south of England. Her father is north of England, Russian. Oh, gosh. <laughs> it's, uh, this is complicated. Uh, yeah, Heinz okay. 57, we call it. <laughs> so, well, then the question becomes, you know, uh, many people, obviously, who come here decide they want to live in neighborhoods that have people like them in them. They do, yes. Uh, was that a factor in your decision-making? Not at all. I guess it'd be hard to find a neighborhood that mixed up anyway. <laughs> exactly. exactly, we might yeah. find we might find one other person with the same with the yeah. same mixture. And we were very straightforward. Um, we believed that we like our children to be able to walk to school, and uh, we asked other professionals where they sent their kids to school. We wanted to send our kids to state schools, and so we don't call them here. What did you mean by that? A state school. A uh, public school. Public schools, yeah. okay. It's, in England, a public school is a private school, and yeah. so we use state and State also. school is a public school, yeah. okay. So um, we, we moved close to the school that they went to. Okay, but now you work on Queen Street, do you not? I work on Queen Street, but also at the university. So, so did you want to, was being downtown important for you for that reason? I always want to, I always like being downtown. You always want to be downtown. Yeah. And you're... And, and you're I, there's, there's a... One, I'm an evidence-based person in part, and there's some very straightforward evidence that shows quality of life. If you want to improve your quality of life, decrease your commute. Right. Yeah. I don't like commuting. So you have next to no commute. Your, your kids can walk to school. Yeah. My wife works downtown as well. Same deal. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's take it from the specific to the more general then. As I just suggested, I think many newcomers who come to this country want to, I mean the evidence is everywhere, they want to live in neighborhoods that, that in which they will find other people of similar ethnicity. So we have little Italy, we've got little Portugal, uh, we've got a lot of um, you know Eastern European people, Ukrainians, Poles living in the west end of Toronto. Uh, we have a preponderance of a Jewish population up in Thornhill, etc, etc, etc. Uh, what are some of the things that you have discovered that newcomers do 
to become part of the kind of informal networks that exist in a big city like this? I'm not completely sure I understand the question. Well, beyond moving into a neighborhood where there are other people like them, how do you get plugged into a city um, so that people can enjoy the kinds of opportunities that you just described in, in what helped bring you here? So that's, that's, that's I understand, so I apologize. Uh, that's an interesting question because um, people use the pathways that are made available to them. And at the moment, we do have these communities uh, and some of the communities function well, some of them don't com function very well. Some of them are resilient, some of them aren't that resilient. But there's not a lot of time that goes into linking communities around Toronto. Not only that, people always talk when they're talking about making things better, hey, build resilient communities. What the research shows is it's not just building resilient communities, but it's linking them to the power and decision-making structures of a society mm -hmm. that makes a difference. It's resilient communities that are efficacious, that can make a difference. So we sometimes talk about, well, how can individuals network in order to get themselves uh, linked in? And they can use the normal professional networks. You, know, you can learn to play hockey. You can do all these sorts of things. But studies worldwide show that all of those informal networks are slowly being broken down because people are working a lot. Hmm. They're working to pay the bills. They're working more than ever. Uh, and they're doing less in the way of these informal social networks that knit society together. There's a chap called Robert Putnam, oh, yes. who wrote Bowling Alone. Bowling Alone. Yeah. And that was about the fact that you know, 20, 30 years ago, you went to a bowling alley in America, you saw lots of teams, informal networks, people rubbing shoulders together. Now when you go there, you see families bowling alone, or you know, a couple of people bowling alone, the teams have gone. But those informal networks, those in, you know, are really important for fusing a society. So if we want a fused society, uh, a networked society in Toronto, it's, it's how we help people build and be involved in those informal networks that's going to be important. Well, do we help people well in this society? I hear all the time that, you know, we, we have... Don't do it. You don't think we do? We don't do it, no. It, we don't do it as much as hmm. we could. And um, so people get into their communities and they build their communities, which is okay, but it doesn't do the job with regards to uh, people's health, people's mental health, and people's... Uh, you know, getting the job that they want. Well, let me just follow up on that, because I, um, I wonder whether people stay separate, because that's what makes them comfortable, being with people like them, versus integrating into other communities around the city, which, frankly, you know, it's more complicated. You know, the, the, there may be pressures from, you know, back where they came from originally. Um, who knows? You know, There's one study I, I, I hate to mention a particular ethnic group because that's just going to get me in okay, trouble here. But so you, don't then. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. one of but the one of the studies I saw recently uh, from a school study uh, showed that in Toronto schools, 60% of kids by the time they left school had had a relationship with somebody from a different uh, racial or ethnic group. Is that a good number? 60%. Sounds high to you. Yeah. Sounds high. Okay. 20% had told their parents. Interesting. So 40 didn't. No, no. 20% 20 of, of 8 out of 10 oh, I see. Excuse me. had not told their parents. All right. And some of that might be due to the fact that you don't always tell your parents what you're doing. But some of it is due to the fact that um, you know, people are exploring and are trying different things and are trying to mix. And so there does seem to be through the, the mixing that happens in school and stuff, there is, there is, people are trying to mix, but there are things that are pulling people back. Quem, t'was ever thus. I, I've heard stories 50 years ago about how Jewish kids would go out on dates and, you know, their parents wouldn't approve of them going out on a date with a non-Jew, so yep. they took a, you know, they, they took a Jewish kid along with them and they pretended to be the couple when in fact it was the other way. Mm -hmm. Now today you replace that probably with that's less controversial today. You know, it might be 
a Christian and a Muslim today, or it might be a Serb and a Croat today. I said I wasn't going to mention names, but here we go. Yeah. Now you can see why parents, why, why kids might not want to tell their parents even today that that's going on. Most eh? definitely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm not saying. You see, I don't think that any of the things that are happening with regards to immigration in Canada are new. The question is, do we learn from things that have happened in the past in order to make it better this time around? And I presume you're coming from a place that says we're a better society, we're a more efficacious, caring society. If we break down all of these barriers and everybody is just, you know, we don't feel as confused or strange about the other. Is that where you're coming from? I'm coming from the point where I say that if we want to do things well, we need to, people need to have choices. And those choices should be for mobility within society and in order to flourish. And that uh, these hard silos between different uh, ethnic groups is probably not going to be the way forward. Okay, tell me this then. Probably for the first 30, 35 years of Canada's official multiculturalism policy, we celebrated our differences and didn't didn't mind living separate lives, as, an ethic, as ethnic groups didn't mind living separate lives. We now have a federal government that's put a new policy in place where they definitely want people to integrate more into whatever mainstream Canadian society means. How do you like the change of uh, policy? Well, I think celebrating is, is fine. Let's all have a party. Let's enjoy the fact that, that we've got uh, sort of a, a culture that is maybe different, special. But celebrating doesn't necessarily pay the bills and it doesn't move the economy forward. And if you're celebrating, but as I said, you're not integrated into society in a way that will get you the job you want or get your community uh, the power or the money to change things, to improve your schools or whatever, celebrating, waste of time. The idea of integrating, if that's the way that uh, the federal government wants to go, uh, would be interesting, but the question is, what exactly are they going to do to help that happen? Well, let's be consistent, because you've all week long been saying, if you want to achieve something, you've got to have a plan. Yeah. Do we have a plan now? I don't see a plan. I see, I see a, a vision or an idea, but not a plan. I mean, how exactly are people going to integrate if they're uh, sitting in a uh, community uh, in part of Scarborough that doesn't have good schools, that doesn't have good services, and that is cut off from sensible jobs. So, it, you know, the community can't move forward, the people can't move forward. But it starts with schools, doesn't it? I think it's, uh, schools are incredibly important, education is important, and, and there is some evidence that we're leaving the poorest in society behind. Education is important, but you have to leave, uh, link that education to people being able to find pathways to decent jobs. Otherwise, you just get frustration. Pathways to decent jobs, how, I mean, take that next step for me here. Once, once you've decided that your school system should be obviously as open as possible and can get as many people from as many different backgrounds learning, playing, doing sports together, I mean, that's an awfully good start, right? How, does, how do you move from there to pathway to good job if you live in a not so nice part of town? Well, that's, this is, you know, this is, there are loads of different things that are important. So you, there's got to be an awareness of what's, what's possible. And one of the things that we'd been talking about in the UK for some time was the idea of mixing people around. So for one week a year or something like that, you mix people from different schools around. So people actually start coming into contact with other mm. people. And, is and busing? No. No. Busing, busing uh, actually, there is some, a lot of work that shows that busing didn't work uh, when they were doing busing on racial lines. Mm. There's a reasonable amount of work that shows that if you bus people on um, uh, socioeconomic lines, uh, that it, did it does work reasonably oh. well. Um, but this is about, you know, you have one week a year where people mix. You move people around to different schools and they do a project together. You do that every year. People start mixing and seeing what's available. People start getting in contact with the other and start thinking that the other isn't the other. And those, you know, these sorts of things, but most people get their jobs by the people they know. Humor me for a second on this. So could you approach the school board and say, I got an idea. Let's take, um, let's take 100 students from Upper Canada College and send them up to school at Jane and Finch and send those hundred students from Jane and Finch and put them at UCC for a week. How, how do you think that would fly? 
Uh, well, I think that UCC is not part of the Toronto District oh, School I Board. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> don't get technical on me here. You I'm know sorry. what I meant. I'm sorry. I don't think you'd want to do that. No? I think what you'd want to do is, I mean, these things have to work. The mixing works when people are mixing on an equal footing. So you take 100 kids from one school and you put it in the other school, I mean, it's going to be chaos. Hmm. And so this idea of mixing, of having a week where you mix people up, would be that that happens to all schools. And so you're talking about 10 from one school, 10 from another school, and they're all there on an equal level trying to you know, do something together. And uh, they learn together and they, they start mixing. And you do that every year. You start getting some just some opportunities. There are loads of different ways of getting opportunities for people to mix. That's, that's just one that we we're thinking about in the UK. That is a neat idea. You should follow up on that. There are lots of things that are possible, <laughs> <laughs> and there are 24 hours in a day. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Well, we're really glad you gave us uh, this week five of those hours, because um, uh, we've really enjoyed having you here all week long talking about, quote unquote, the other in our society. Quam McKenzie, originally from the UK, comes to Toronto via Boston, Massachusetts, and we're glad to have you in the city, in that chair, all week long here on the agenda. Thanks so much. Well, thanks very much for having me.